Animorphs fans and welcome back to the Animorphs universe. We're looking at another episode of the TV series today and it's episode number seven. In the previous episode we found Axe, it was basically the TV series version of The Message. And now we fast forward to the TV series version of Book 17 The Underground. This is very strange why they suddenly fast forward to this story when they've got so much to cover in between. And it also doesn't help that of the first 20 or so books, this is the first real dod. At least in my opinion, I thought this book was pretty dreadful, especially when you consider all the books around it. So how does the TV series cope with bad source material? Will the budget affect it? Yes. Will it fumble and bumble its way through a dodgy storyline? Most certainly yes. And uh, will we get a demonic desk fan thing? It, it, yeah, there it is. Let's just discuss the name of this episode. You'd think it was called The Underground, considering that's what the, that's the book that the show is based on. But no, it's called The Escape, which is book 15, which is the book where they travel to Royan Island to find Marco's mother, who's making control of sharks. Spoiler alert, that's got nothing to do with this episode we're about to watch now. So why they've named this episode The Escape, it's anybody's guess, honestly. I know why it's not called The Underground, sort of. Because the underground section that comes in The Underground, the book version, is a bit more substantive than what we get in the TV episode. But let's crack on, let's not bugger about anymore. Let's see how the TV series handles the underground, or in its case, the escape. Marco, Rachel and Axe are hanging out in this cafe, this busy cafe, and they're talking loudly about Jake allowing them to morph to sneak into planet Hollywood. This is of course a reference to how the book starts, because in that one they're discussing, can we go to planet Hollywood? Because people like Arnold Schwarzenegger are there. But Rachel, Marco and Axe are talking about going to the Planet Hollywood event where Arnold Schwarzenegger will be loudly in this very busy cafe. And I find it ironic that they're saying we shouldn't go to Planet Hollywood because it's a security risk to use our morphs there. Well, being a complete security risk in this cafe talking loudly about morphing. Do you think it's ironic? I think it's ironic. In the books, they convince Jake to let them go. But in the TV series, Rachel, the responsible one, says... Jake will never go for it. He'll say it's too risky. Risky? No. A little sneaky, maybe. Besides, we're not supposed to change for selfish reasons. Even the opening of Planet Hollywood. So we never see them go to Planet Hollywood. We then get a joke from Axe, very reminiscent of the sort of stuff he comes up with in the books. Arnold will be there. Who is this? Arnold. Is he from the planet of Hollywood? He also struggles to drink his milkshake properly. It's then when Marco sees this guy. Now this turns out to be George Edelman. He's sitting at the counter of this cafe, eating oatmeal sweatily. <laughs> That's one way you could put it. Edelman is clearly having a bit of a breakdown. He's sweating profusely, he's shivering, he's shaking, and he's begging for more oatmeal. In fact, he's emptied the place out. It becomes clear that the culprit here is very clearly the demonic desk fan. Seriously, this desk, is it called, is it desk fan? I don't know, it's some, 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 it's some sort of fan. And they keep, sh the director keeps thinking, boom, we're gonna get an undershot of this fan. That's the true villain in all of this, according to the director and the way he's shooting it. Marco then says that it makes Axe look normal. And then we get a shot of Axe, of course, eating his milkshake in the wrong way. Middle Eastern style, might I add. Now I get the feeling that the episode order has actually been mixed up here. Remember that this is further down the line. This is book 17 that we're basing this episode on. Before this episode, all we saw of Axe was him being rescued and they found him in the woods and he acquired his human morph and we never saw anything else. The next scene, chronologically, is him eating food improperly. The next episode, Thinking Ahead, introduces us to Axe in depth and shows us his 
eating habits, how he eats everything, how he gets obsessed with food. I get the feeling that it's used running gags here that haven't quite been established yet. And I feel that the episodes should have been swapped. I genuinely do feel like that is the case here. And later down the line, when I do my own little Animals TV series edit, I'll probably do a lot of swapping, and I think it'll make more sense. It just feels like this running gag has just turned up and hasn't been properly introduced, which it is in the next episode, so there's that. Not that this is the episode's fault in itself, it's the scheduling. It's the scheduling's fault. Put it this way, Marco says the joke of, well, that guy makes acts look normal. Well, that joke works <laughs> if we know Axe's character, because at this point we don't. We don't know Axe's character. We don't know that he acts weird in human morph. Because we haven't had that episode. We haven't had episode 8, The Alien, yet. So the joke doesn't work if you're looking at it in a chronological order. Anyway, I've said enough. Carry on. The demonic desk fan causes Edelman to get up out of his seat and crawl towards the Animorphs. Edelman then crouches down by the animal's table, rubbing profusely at his ear. A definite sign that he is, in fact, a yerk. Edelman's actor is actually very good here. He pulls off the crazy guy pretty damn good. All the way down to the profuse sweating and the bulging eyes. Great stuff, mate. And then we get Rachel's monologue saying, the yerks are everywhere, as if she knew that this guy was a controller. But how? He was rubbing at his ear a lot, but he's... Clearly crazy, you know, Rachel's just like, who is clearly a yerk? Okay, but funnily enough, we get the intro in this next bit here. And then Cassie comes in with the meta, how do you know, line. It was not crazy. He had a yerk in his head, I'm sure. What, is because he stuck his finger in his ear? Dude was freaking out. Yeah, but most controllers don't do that. Yes, Cassie, I've been saying this all along. Just because he stuck his finger in his ear, which actually he didn't, he just rubbed it. Even if he did that, that doesn't necessarily mean he's a yerk. Why has it taken up till now for somebody to say that? <laughs> Thank you, Cassie. Uh, and then, of course, she's proven immediately wrong. You won't believe this. I know who the guy from the diner is. His name's Edelman. My mom's law firm just gave her a really big case. I saw the folder, and inside was a picture of that guy, Edelman. His family's trying to lock him up. They think he's crazy. So? So, he told them that he has an alien living inside his head. An alien called a yerk. I'm pretty sure that Demon Cassie is absolutely miffed how her evil plan has been deflected. Damn it, I almost had them there. Rachel establishes that Edelman was taken to a psychiatric hospital, and Jake says that the plan is to go in. Marco then says, I'm in, before Rachel does it and makes a joke out of it. That's all well and good, except for the fact that this is book 17, Marco, and we haven't had the episode where he finds out that his mother is a yerk yet. Why does that matter? Because the whole point of Marco before finding out that his mother is a controller, is that he doesn't want any part of it. He doesn't think they should be doing it. So, again, it seems like the scheduling is all wrong. There is an episode, there's a two-parter, two actually, later on in the series, where Marco finds out that his mother is indeed a controller. That needs to happen before he starts being like, oh, I'm in, I want to do this mission. Because that's not what he was like before he saw that his mother was a controller. That was his, the crux of his character. So the TV series just does away with it. And it's incredibly frustrating. But anyway, up to this point, the episode had been pretty much in line with the book. The major difference being how they found Edelman. So in the TV series, they find him in a diner acting a bit crazy. In the book, he jumped out of a high rise. Bit of a difference, but I'm putting that down to budget and depiction of suicide or, or attempted suicide on a kids TV program. It's probably not something that kids TV would have. It's where the books hit a bit harder. I mean, they were young adult books, not young child books. But of course, Nickelodeon had to sanitize it somewhat. But then this is where the show differs a bit from the books, because in the books, they had this whole thing where they morphed to some form of bug. I can't, I think it was, no, it wasn't spider. What was it? It was flies, wasn't it? 
Well, cockroaches. It was something. But they go into a truck with bananas and there's a spider that attacks them and they crawl into the walls and they crawl into the bathroom. They've snuck in that way because they can't just walk into this place. It's heavily guarded. It's a psychiatric hospital. How are they going to get in and just, you know, walk in like as themselves? Well, the TV doesn't bother with any of that. They just walk in. Rachel and Marco, being the most eager participants in this which is unlike Marco, but regardless, we've already had that discussion. They go into the psychiatric hospital and they've somehow managed to dress themselves up as doctors and get in without any problems at all. Maybe this was a 90s thing where things weren't as secure, but whatever, they're in. We also get a very politically incorrect depiction of people with mental health problems. I mean, it's not beyond Animorphs. <laughs> Animorphs was never politically correct. And in fact, it's funny because is, it, is that another irony? A big portion of this book is basically saying, don't call them nuts. Ah, but they're nuts. And they're all joking about being politically incorrect. And the TV series just depicts these people with mental health issues pretending to be airplanes. <laughs> you wouldn't get away with that these days. <laughs> Rachel and Marco sneak into George Edelman's room. George Edelman, opposed to the people pretending to be airplanes and singing little songs, he's just standing by his window looking full on outside of, of the facility. And he clearly seems normal at this stage, but the animals quickly find out that things aren't quite as they seem and he's still having these breakdowns in his, in his room. We then get the height of bigotry from Mr. Edelman. Aren't you a little short for doctors? Are you saying short people can't be doctors? What are you trying to say, eh? I mean, what are you trying to say? I'll beat you up, I will. I mean, what, what, you can't say that. Short people can't be doctors. That's discriminatory. You should definitely stay in this place, mate. In fact, you deserve to be executed. I won't have it. I won't have people being heightist. Okay? This guy's a bad dude. Rachel, lion morph. Dispose of this wretch. Might as well, he might as well be Hitler, honestly. Rachel, just get rid, get rid. He's, he's past the point of no return. He's irredeemable. Rachel and Marco have a chat with Mr. Edelman who gives them the spiel you'd expect. He talks about how he is a controller, but the instant maple actually forces the yerk into some sort of addiction and the yerk loses control and Edelman is able to be partially free, but he does have his breakdowns as seen in this scene. Oh no. This is a, a great little scene, and Edelman's actor kills it again. Great job. I don't know the actor's name, but he, he does a great job, actually, as playing of playing George Edelman. And we establish the basic stuff at first, and then we get some weird stuff thrown in as well, whereby we just start learning information that we already knew, and then stupid Rachel returns. <laughs> Yerks, they need special kind of food called Condrona Rays every three days. They can't live without it. They keep it in the um, yerk pools. You know, that's great and all. If we hadn't already learned that from the Blair Witch Tom scene in episode three, where Chapman finds him staring at a wall in a cupboard. In that scene, the Animorphs, Jake and Marco specifically, learn that every three days they go down to the Yurt Pool to regenerate. And Kondrona is mentioned there as what they feed on. So this revelation from Edelman seems entirely pointless. We've already established these things. The only thing you can say about this scene is that it's revealed specifically that the Kondrona is in the uh, pool, as in the source of it. But even that is sort of implied in the scene from earlier where they say they feed on Kondrona in the Yerk pool. It's sort of, it's sort of implied. Yeah, it's not a very big revelation. So the end of this scene comes across as a bit weak. And then Rachel, stupid Rachel, asks where the Yerk pool is. Where is this Yerk pool? It's underneath the entire town. We know where the Yurt Pool is, Rachel. You've been there. You've been in the Yurt Pool. Why, what, what, you're wasting time. 
Tobias has already told you, hey guys, somebody's coming. Somebody else is in this hospital walking toward the door. <laughs> Cheers, Tobias, being helpful as usual. <laughs> Don't waste time by asking, what's two plus two? No, just ask pertinent questions or get out, Rachel. God damn. Edelman informs the Animos that the Yerks stay inside the host's head, but they lose control, and that the only people that can get rid of the Yerk in the head is another controller, who then just puts another Yerk in. This proceeds, the animals escaping, just as two controllers come into the room. Rachel and Marco watch on through the crack of a door as these controllers somehow remove the old Yerk from Edelman here, and replace replace it with a new yerk that comes in this this coffee flask <laughs> right there's a there is a, a major question here how how do they do it edmund says the only people that can remove a yerk is another controller how that's not in the books what do they do because the yerk is in edmund's head and we never actually see what happens but these controllers of this coffee flask come up and then something happens and they put this new yerk in. What do they do? Do they just like reach into his ear and like pull it out? Or do they have got the pair of tongs? Is it a pair of tongs? Or is it like some dilution that they put into the ear? And it, I, I don't know. They, they, it's just, it happens. It just happens. In the books, the yerks can't be taken out and they just live inside the host's brain forever, which is a completely different fate, really. And I'm not sure which one I prefer. In, in some ways, I prefer George Edelman's fate in the TV series. Because in the book, what's his fate? He's just like this forever until the end of the book when Rachel breaks him out of the Mental Health Institute and he's just left to fend for himself in the wild and would probably be dead within a week. Uh, I actually prefer Edelman's fate here. Not on, when I say prefer, I just mean story-wise, plot-wise that they just replace his yerk and he's back to being a controller. I find that a little bit more convincing than Rachel breaking him out to live as a homeless man. I, this was a crap book, by the way, so it's not surprising that on occasion, the TV series did it a bit better. <laughs> but that still doesn't explain how the controllers get the old yerk out. But whatever the case, they get rid of this old yerk and put the new one in. I will just point out as well that at this point in this scene, they haven't removed the yerk yet, and this controller is already using tongs to pull out the replacement yerk, which he then apparently holds to Edelman's ear. So, does the new yerk tempt the old one out, or do they just put the new yerk in and that yerk? kicks out the old... It's a weird process, and it's anybody's guess, honestly. But anyway, Rachel watches on, and you know what impulsive Rachel's like. By the way, she can morph a lion, and she can speed morph, because this is the TV series, and it's the that's the rule that the TV series has set. So Rachel, impulsive Rachel, watches on and does nothing. <laughs> it just doesn't feel right. It feels like, you know, actual Rachel, who's clearly got a soft spot for this Edelman character, feels bad for him. She wouldn't just let two yokes go in there, unsupervised, and carry out this horrible act. She would do something. And maybe Marco would have to hold her back. But still, she would try, wouldn't she? Instead, she just gives up like, oh, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> we finish that scene with Tobias flying out of his tree. And for once, he's actually been bloody useful. Tobias, well done. You've tracked Edelman as he's left with these two other controllers to a place called Tom's Burgers. Well done. Been useful for once in your blooming birdie life. Bastard. Tobias sees Edelman's van pull up with these two controllers and they walk into Tom's Burgers, which is a diner probably somewhere nearby. Notice as well that these controllers now have handyman belts around their waists. It's a strange costume change because they didn't have, you can see they, they're both wearing utility belts with like tools in them. They didn't have those, in the, look, I'll show you. Look at here. These controllers do not have utility belts on here. 
It's clearly the same controls. You can tell by the haircut and the dark blue suits they've got on, the, uh, the overalls. They're still wearing those overalls. They both got the same haircut, so it's the same blokes. Edelman's with them, now in a suit, somehow, for some reason. And these two controllers have acquired these utility belts as if they've just been out plumbing. What's going on, guys? Why, why are you now wearing utility belts? I know it's a minor point, but it just... It's weird, and I don't know why they're wearing those. There's a sound that's building up in the background here, by the way, and I will play it for you in a second. And then suddenly it flashes up Vista 3's face with a very The Shining-esque discordant noise. And it does remind me of something like you'd see in The Shining. I can't remember which sheen exactly, but look at this bit now and just picture a Stanley Kubrick, Stephen King horror movie sort of picture. I don't know, I, I approve. There was a very sort of horror ambience that just creeped in there, crept in, and uh, and then it goes away. <laughs> it's good, good knowing you, horror ambience. Maybe see you again, maybe? I hope, please. At least it's interesting, <laughs> unlike the rest of us. We are now back in Visa 3's lab with him and his bald-headed scientist. Not that I can speak much about the follically challenged. The scientist introduces a Horbajir to Visa 3, a test subject who's had his or her yerk removed. The unyerked Horbajir then obeys Visa 3 and walks under this Gleet biofilter archway. About five seconds later, the Horbajir is disintegrated. The message I'm getting here is basically don't stand under these lights for a prolonged period of time. Of else you're fine, you know, just walk through it. But if you stop and stand still for a little while, if you get, give it a chance to think, then you're screwed, buster. But there's a, this, this part is annoying because this scientist says, we've taken the yerk out of this hawk bajir. And Visa 3 says, step forward, hawk bajir. And the hawk bajir steps forward. So what's the point? Is there any point to a yerk being in a hawk bajir if it's still just going to obey? I mean, it's just as freaking useless. Yerked ones don't do anything, unyerked ones just walk forward and kill themselves at will. I'm, what, what's the, what's the point? What is the point? Let's face it, in the in the TV series, the Hawk Bajir are just mindless zombie monsters, basically. They just slowly walk from here to there. And it doesn't matter if they got a yerk in them or not. In the book series, it's a completely different story. I mean, in, yeah, in the book series, Visa 3 wouldn't be able to tell a free hawk bajir, walk to your death, and it would just do it. You know, I, I can't see that. Can you? Especially when he's just being guided by this frumpy dumpy controller scientist. Not a chance. But this is the TV series, and the hawk bajir are basically just an intimidation factor. That's all bark and no bite. So, pff, whatever. Might as well be a bloody might as, well, might as well be big bird honestly anyway this gleet biofilter has proven successful and disintegrates the hawk bajir big george e then comes in with his new new suit on looking hard as nails visa three says you step forward So he's will he sees this controller come in with this big fancy suit on looking all serious and Visa is like, you, risk your own death for me. <laughs> I mean, it's actually strangely in character. So um, I'm not too miffed about that. But yeah, it's just George Edelman comes in, Visa Free says, you, kill yourself. <laughs> and Edelman's just like, yeah, whatever, I'll kill myself. Thing is, he probably would have done if he actually hadn't just walked straight through. Because remember, the Hawkwood just stood in the archway. Edelman just walks through. So it's not really a fair test, is it? It's not very really scientific. Edelman, stand under there for a prolonged period. See what changes then. Visa 3 takes this rather unscientific test as a success and orders that the Gleet biofilters be placed at all Yerkpool entrances. Very good. Very good. Now, install these at every pool entrance. I want these Andalite bandits! Yes, sir. 
So this is really wants these now put in every Yerk Paul entrance. To which Edmund says, yes, sir. To which I say, what's it got to do with you? You've literally just walked in after having been in a psychiatric ward. Prior to that, your host, your, your controller, whatever, you were just... You were going crazy eating oatmeal. You've had a new Yerk put in to a dodgy host who's been suffering, and yet now you're walking into Visa 3's laboratory and taking his direct orders. Make it, uh, that doesn't make sense. Why isn't the scientist the one saying, yes, sir? Why is Edelman coming in and just saying, yes, sir, to Visa 3 saying, put those things in there? It just doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, this is the last we see of Edelman. So, <laughs> what is the point? Ugh. I honestly think it's just a way to connect the plot because we saw that Tobias followed Edelman to the, Fis the Viss's lab at Tom's Burgers, which is eventually where the animals come to find the Yerpool entrance. So in order to make that connection, they had to make Edelman's journey to Tom's Burgers relevant. So at the end of the scene, they have him coming up to Visser 3 and taking the order, even though he seems completely out of place to take that order. Yeah, that pro that's probably it, explaining it. <laughs> So Visa 3 has given the order to put all these Gleet biofilters at every entrance of the yoke pool. We now move on to the next scene, which takes place in the barn. He screamed and cried as they put another yerk in his head. Don't feel so bad, there's nothing you could have done. They would have caught you. Don't feel so bad, there's nothing you could have done. Excuse me, Cassie, she can speed more for frickin' lion. There probably is something she could have done, actually. Just saying. Just saying. This is actually quite a good barn scene where we get some ethical questions about do we attack the human controllers or do we attack just the Yerks? Do we want to take that risk? And there's that moral back and forth, which was actually very prevalent in the book series, but not quite so much in the TV series. So kudos for the TV series for tackling it in this instance. Yeah, I really approve of this barn scene. Some good ethical questions going on. All the characters are acting as they should. The thing about this episode is it's so full of ups and downs. It's, it shows off the best of the TV series, but also the worst. And the worst is yet to come. So treasure these moments now. Treasure this scene because it goes mighty downhill from here. So far we're halfway through the episode in the first half with a couple of little missteps, like the lab scene we just saw. Most of this episode has been close to the books it's made necessary budgetary steps, but effective ones. And it's all been held to get together quite nicely. It's been a good show so far. So let's finish off this barn scene and then we'll, we'll, we'll find out what happens to the episode. We then get a bit of a monologue from Jake uh, trying to give his reasoning for taking action here. And he uses the American Civil War as an analogy. Would I do this to my brother Tom? He'd be free. He'd have a yerk in his brain forever. I couldn't do it. Isn't some freedom better than none? During the Civil War, they were fighting to end slavery. How did they do that? By killing the slaves? No, by, by going after the slave owners. Jake is actually largely incorrect here. In a couple of ways. And uh, forgive me for going into American history and getting my nerdy glasses on. Slavery was a big part of the reason behind the Civil War, but the overarching point was states' rights, if I'm remembering correctly. That was the major reason behind the American Civil War. The rights to own slaves being one of those states' rights. So you could argue that in part the Civil War was about slavery, but that wasn't the reason. That wasn't the major reason. It was just a component of the major reason. Secondly, he says, you know, the, uh, the Union didn't go after the slaves. They went after the slave owners. Well, not really. Who, who died in most of these battles? Were they slave owners? No, they were just people who were in the... Uh, confederacy military and most of them the vast majority of them didn't own slaves so no they weren't killing slave owners they were killing people who worked for the slave owners 
And in a way, they're sort of like slaves because, you know, back in those days, if you abandoned your post and you're part of that military, then it was the bullet in the head for you. So they couldn't really do much about it. And they were the one that's, ones that suffered the casualties. So no, Jake, they didn't go after the slave owners. They went after the people who worked for the slave owners. Not necessarily the slaves, but people who also didn't really have a choice in what they did. So your point is completely upside down. The slave owners were probably the ones sending Confederate soldiers into battle and, you know, not being killed. It was the soldiers that were being killed and they wouldn't have been slave owners. They wouldn't have had to be soldiers if they were slave owners because typically soldiers aren't rich people. So no, Jake, it's a bad analogy. And to be fair, it was Canadians that made this show. So maybe that's why they're not doing it right. I don't know. And also this is contrary, not only to history itself, but what happens in the books. Jake's saying we don't kill the slaves, we kill the slave owners. When in the books, they have a major battle pretty much at the end of every book, wherein they are killing slaves of the Irks. Why? Out of necessity to win the battle. Show is, and book not aligning here. The, the show's just completely missed the point. Why bring up this analogy? It doesn't work. Yeah, just take any battle in the animal series where, for example, the animals kill a bunch of hawk bajir, and they always feel bad afterwards thinking, oh my God, I, I killed hawk bajir, but it was necessary at the time in order to win the eventual fight. That is apparently not what Jake wants to do in the TV series. To be fair, in the TV series, they never have battles. So they never actually kill anyone. For budgetary reasons, probably, and sanitary reasons for the Nickelodeon audience. So fair enough, if you want to say, well, they never actually kill anyone in, in the TV series. Fair enough. But it doesn't match up with the morality that the books show. So uh, that's, a val that's a good discussion actually to have. So if you want to carry on that discussion, uh, send me messages in the comments or have a discussion amongst yourselves. I do think it's a very interesting topic. The morality of going after, for example, the soldiers of people who do bad things rather than the bad people themselves. Because if the Union soldiers didn't kill Confederate soldiers who themselves weren't slave owners and probably didn't have much of a say of what the people above them did. Is that morally correct or should they have just not killed anyone because of, because I don't know. What's your opinion? Tell me. Let's move on. The scene ends with Jake saying that they ought to go back to the Yerk pool. This is then followed by a joke from Marco and everybody smiling, cheery. Oh, what a wonderful time we're having. This isn't the face you pull when you've just made a decision to go down to the Yerk pool. Oh, what a funny jape. No, you should be sad. In the books, you would be sad. We're going back to the Yerk pool. Doesn't end with, ha ha, funny joke. <laughs> no, you'd be sad, Jake. Sean, stop smiling. That's inappropriate. Again, it's just another case where the book just completely misses the mark. As much as this was a great barn scene, it all capitulates in like the last 20 seconds to an absolute mess of bad analogies and ill-placed tonal shifts. We're then transported to the next scene and we're back in Tom's Burgers where it's somebody's birthday. Is this birthday cake relevant at all? Of course not. It's just the director having an odd one. Just like the fan from the first scene, there's got to be an irrelevant object being the subject of focus, briefly, for some unknown reason. Maybe it was the birthday cake that did it this time. How could you, birthday cake? I only see five candles there. I don't know why that's relevant, but, but God damn you. Jake meets the others in Tom's Burgers and they got a big bowl of chips between them. The first question he asks is... Where's Axe? He's at home. We didn't know how long it would take to get the password. He's at home. He didn't know how long it would take to get a password. Bearing in mind that Rachel's in the background here and within about five, no, about 20 seconds of this bit, she comes back to them with a password. So just saying. But anyway, where is his home? <laughs> oh, Axe, he's back at home. 
What, what, is he back in space? Is he back on his own planet? Where's home? I mean, we haven't had that explained. Again, was this episode aired too early? Was this episode meant to air later? Because we've got no idea where Axe's home is. And Cassie just saying, oh, he's at home, gives us no context. What, it's, 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 it's bollocks, basically, isn't it? It's bollocks. But anyway, we get a funny bit where Marco and Jake exchange germs over a chip. I can't believe oatmeal is our secret weapon. No kidding. I mean, any battle involving oatmeal is not going to be historic. Take Gettysburg. There was no major oatmeal involvement. World War II. Neither side used oatmeal? And was it oatmeal storm? No. Rachel's been at the counter and she she sees somebody do the password. So security's a bit la <laughs> lackadaisical there. But she comes back to the animals and says, the password is, I want a cheeseburger. Hold the cheese. In the books, it's, I want a happy meal of extra happy. I get the feeling that they couldn't do that for copyright reasons in the TV series. So as much as we lose a bit of an Animos meme, it's understandable. But anyway, Rachel apparently sees all this happen and she says, oh, you go back and there's a door that you walk through and that's your entrance to the Yerk Pool. So she's seen that from where she was standing just a moment ago at the edge of the counter over there. She's seen all of that, okay? And uh, it's quite convenient that Tom's Burgers is now basically the central hub for Yerk activity. So we now know that this is an entrance to the Yerk Pool and it's also where Visa 3's laboratory is. So yeah, Tom's Burgers is where everything goes down now. So what happens next? We're not hanging out at Planet Hollywood. Don't remind me. Marco echoes our sentiments there. God damn. We're not in the books, are we? We're in the goddamn TV series. We then get what is frankly an amazing scene with Chip. And I love the camera angle. They, I gen genuinely enjoy how they film him. Hi, and welcome to Tom's Burgers. My name is Chip. I'm proud to be your server today here at Tom's Burgers, home of the Big Tom Burger and the Tom Tom Fries. Hi, my name is Chip. How may I help you today? We'd like four cheeseburgers. Hold the cheese. Hold the cheese? I've got to make a meme out of this guy. <laughs> Just hold the cheese. There's got to be a meme in there somewhere. Help me out, guys, if I don't make one myself already. The animals give the password and Chip sends them into the back rooms. And one wonders whether the guy who comes up to Chip afterwards isn't at all suspicious of what's just occurred. The animals then walk into this back room and, and one wonders, how did Rachel see this? Because it's clear they, that's a different hallway entirely. So they've obviously come round the counter, round the back, and now they've come into a completely different room. And Rachel saw all this from her position by the counter against the front window of Tom's Burgers? How? How did she see all this? Rachel then steps into the Gleep biofilter and is there for a good few seconds. I've just counted. Rachel stands amidst the Gleep biofilter, betwixt its laser pointed things. And she's there for approximately nine seconds. She stands under the filter for nine seconds before the scene cuts to black. Might I, might I add as well that these things were installed bloody quickly. So let's look at the timeline. Visa 3 tells his underlings to install these devices once Edelman gets to him. So the animals spoke to Edelman and got the information they needed before that and they went Back to, hold, hold on. I'm going to do, I'm going to go do a clothing check. Marco and Rachel are both wearing a striped shirt. Cassie's in this red thing with denim braces and Jake's in a black shirt. What are they all wearing here? Now well, they're wearing different clothing here to be fair. So in the prior barn scene, they're all wearing the same costumes. So this barn scene prior is the same day that they walk into Tom's Burgers. And it feels to me, judging by how it's been paced, this happens after they see Edelman. So I'm thinking that the first barn scene takes place the day before they go into the hospital to see Edelman. I mean, it's, it's one of two things, because there's, there's clearly a time skip somewhere, because maybe this is on the same day. So let's be generous here. So day one, when they're discussing the crazy guy in the cafeteria thing, that's the same day that they end up going to the hospital. You can't tell because they're wearing hospital clothes. They've had, they've had a change of clothes. 
So that's day one. We then get the scene in the lab and then the next time we see the Animorphs, they're in the barn again and they've all had a change of clothes. So maybe it's a week down the line, maybe it's a single day down the line, but it's definitely not the same day as the first barn scene. Whatever the case, it can't be too long after they've been to the hospital because they're actually discussing the information they got from Edelman. So I highly doubt they'd have waited a week for uh, Marco and Rachel to come to the barn and tell the others about what they learned from Edelman. I reckon it's gotta be within one or two days, but it's in the space of those one or two days that Visa 3 says, install is every uh, pool entrance to them indeed being installed at the Yerk Ball entrance. That's a bloody quick turnaround to the Yerk's credit. You know, they got straight on that one. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's just weird. I don't know how long it's taken from get to, from first half of the episode to the second half. I don't know how long that, the gap is between. Theoretically, it all happens on the same day. That Visa 3 says to the Yerk's, get these up. And then a couple of scenes later, they're up. Maybe it all happened in exactly the same day. Who knows? It just doesn't seem realistic. Anyway, my final point for this bit is, what was the plan? They come up to this Gleet by filter with the obvious aim of getting into the Yerk pool, but they've not brought oatmeal with them. To be fair, this is exactly the same in the book. So they're just working with the source material. In the book, they have this exact similar scene where they bypass the password bit and they go to the Gleet Biofilter, the entrance to the Earth pool, and they want to go in, but they get kicked out again by the Gleet Biofilter. In the book, you have to ask the question of, what were they doing? Because they didn't bring any oatmeal with them, and the whole point was to bring oatmeal with them into the Earth pool. So that's source material problem. That's not the TV series fault. That's the book's fault, just so you're aware. Naughty book. Bad plot, bad writing. It would have been nice though for the TV show to address that or do something about it, but they just stuck to the source material, whether it made sense or not. Anyway, the Animorphs speed morph into Cockroach before Chip can find them, and we move on to the next scene. We're back in the barn for the third time in this episode and Axe has decided to show up this time. He informs the Animorphs that the Gleet Biofilter is Andalite technology that's clearly been manipulated by the Yerks. In Axis words, there's a three second delay before total molecular disintegration. Rachel was stood under that, stood under that thing for nine seconds. That hawk bajir in the early scene was there for about five or six seconds. So you're a bit off there, Axe, but maybe that's because the Yerks manipulated it and it just made it take more time. You know, I'm making an excuse for the TV series here. I'm being generous. <laughs> Let's just say that's how it is. The animals fear that they've therefore been cut off from the Yerk pool. But Cassie, the animal expert, clearly has a solution to this problem, and it's ferrets. In the book, it's moles. I get the feeling that they couldn't afford moles in the budget. <laughs> so they settled with somebody's pet ferret. <laughs> They're not quite as good at digging as moles are, are they? <laughs> They're probably not gonna be able to dig a hole substantial enough to get down to the earth pool, but it's budget. <laughs> I mean, in the books, even the moles were basically pathetic when it came to that. They got lucky and fell into a bat cave. But of course, we're not gonna be able to do a bat cave in this episode. We ain't got the budget for it. So we're gonna skip all that logic nonsense and just pretend that the ferret's good enough for the job. Excellent. By the way, this is basically Cassidy's only character now is she can suggest a decent morph for the time that it's needed. To be fair, she did that sometimes in the books, but that wasn't her, her whole character, far from it. But in the books, in the, TV, in the TV series, that's basically her character. She knows animals. The only thing that distinguishes her from Rachel. <laughs> Cass H. Lee is still a thing, with this one exception. The next scene opens up with a small abandoned shack-like thing or outbuilding. I don't know what that is. But the implication is that the animals want to get inside. In fact, they talk about opening it up by use of force. What we need is a jackhammer to crack open the old entrance. So surely they're gonna break into this building and dig from there. Because the director opened up with that being the central subject of the shot. And then Marco says, we could break in with a jackhammer. So clearly 
the mission is to get in that thing, right? Turns out that they just dig a hole somewhere in the vicinity of this old abandoned building. The, the building itself is entirely irrelevant to everything. So why bring it up? They then ask the question... Wait, how are we going to get all this open within such a small ferret hole? Shouldn't you have thought of that before going to where you needed to start the mission? How do we get the oatmeal in? But now apparently they get to this place and then they decide to go buy some water balloons. Unless Rachel had already brought them with her, but why would she have done that without telling them that it was part of the plan? <sighs> Whatever. They buy a bunch of water balloons and make the oatmeal out here and put them in the water balloons out in the open before digging with shovels, even though they're digging as ferrets. So I suppose they, they dug, <laughs> they, hold on a minute. So they've dug a hole with a shovel and then I imagine Rachel just took it from there basically. So they basically just removed the topsoil and then just Rachel, just Rachel in a ferret morph <laughs> goes and digs the hole down to the yerk pool. The earlier part of the scene has Rachel saying, I'll go first, clearly indicating that they're gonna do it in turns. But then in the next scene, it's, it's Rachel that comes out saying, I've done it. And the, the other animals are talking as if she's only just gone down in there for the first time, making it seem as if they've just left her to do the entire job by herself. <laughs> you bastards. She's been down there a long time. I'm sure she's fine, Rachel's into it. I don't know, she's claustrophobic. She hates small places. Anyway, Rachel pops up out of a completely different hole to the one we saw earlier and says, we're in. Where are they in? Well, they're in a stairway, somehow. This is just the most bizarre shift. So Rachel has managed to dig a hole into the yerk ball. And the next scene is just them all as themselves in their own bodies, passing water balloons down a line. And then Marco holding out to the last person who isn't there and being all confused. And I'm just as confused as you are, Marco. I don't know what the hell's just happened. What, what has happened here? We've missed a whole segment from that point to this point. It, it's, it just doesn't seem to connect at all. They just dug and jumped into the staircase, demorphed and they, they dropped all the water balloons in and they start passing it down a line. But the line must have just started there, so they've obviously just did... That's where the hole... Is. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. It's just silly. It's just really silly. We then get a strangely meta line again. Where is everybody? Yes, Cassie, where is everybody? It's just completely deserted. They're, they're just playing silly buggers in this corridor and not a single yerk is around to say, Oi, what's all this? You got a license to do that? No, not a single one of them has done that. It's just deserted. It's rubbish. Jake then tells Tobias to keep watch. His response being, like a hawk. Yeah, that's all well and good. Except that Tobias can't morph. So he can't be a ferret. And so he can't go down a ferret hole. How is Tobias here? Show? Did he just spawn? <laughs> is it like in Minecraft? Is he like the dog in Minecraft? Where if you walk far enough away, he just <laughs> spawns back into place near you? Is that what happens here? Oh, it don't matter because he dies anyway. So just because the Yerks now have the Gleet biofilter, they feel that any other security measures just don't need to happen anymore. So the Animorphs just as themselves of handfuls of water balloons just sneak around the yurt pool and find decent positions with which to <laughs> unleash an ambush. Also, there are controllers there, but all they're doing is, well, there's a Hawkbajir walking around somewhere, looking at nothing. And there are these controllers standing at the edge of the yurt pool, just looking at the water. Also, by the way, Axe is stupid. Did you know that? He's, he's clueless. Yeah, it would have been nice to have an episode developing his character before this one. So that you've actually got the context for it. Because we don't know Axe at this point, and now he's just standing here like a buffoon, looking like he's trying to sabotage the mission. And Marco has to pull him in. It's just, we, do, we need 
this episode's in the wrong place. I know it. For some reason, they've put it as episode seven when it should have been something like episode 10. For some reason. Because, but yeah, Axe is stupid now, apparently. And that's not even... He's not like that in the box. He isn't. For some reason, he just... I mean, listen to this. Now, this probably isn't the time to ask, but you can throw, can't you? Good. Yeah. What is throw? What is throw? You've got a translator chip in your head. Surely, I mean, you've got arms. Your race has got arms. Surely they know to throw things. You know, launch something like as a projectile using momentum and other such forces. He's just now the stupid one. He's taken Rachel's position as the stupid one of the group. <laughs> but he's, the, he's supposed to, it's It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work, show. It doesn't. In Human Morph, he's crazy around food. That is not the same as just being stupid in general. It's, they're, diff, they're different things. Put it this way. In his underlight body, he comes across as very smart, very calm, and very on point. He's like the smartest one there and he knows the right answer to all sorts of alien things. As soon as he gets into his human body in the TV series, he just becomes this blundering buffoon. And I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to emulate the book series, but Axe wasn't a buffoon or a blundering idiot in the book series. He just was crazy around food and he, he repeated syllables a lot. He wasn't stupid. He didn't become stupid when he was a human, okay? But in the, t in the TV series, it's, he turns into Forrest Gump, basically. <laughs> That's, it's not right, because it's basically a different character at that point. And light, axe, smart, knows what he's doing, on the ball, human axe, doesn't even know that he needs to hide behind an object from the sight of the Yerks. Doesn't, he doesn't even know how, oh my God. Forget it, I'm not even gonna explain it. I can't, I'm speechless almost. We then get shots of Jake and Rachel taking their ambush spots and notice things in the background, everybody. In the background of these two shots in a row. Firstly with Jake, he finds this bit here to hide behind, but look what's behind him. A bunch of people. Now, firstly, it looks like there's meant to be laser grids edited in there, but they're not. So I imagine these are hosts. You can see the, the laser, where the laser grid is supposed to be, but these hosts, no, nah, there's no laser grid there. They could probably just run out. But that's not the most important part, okay? They're hosts, okay? What happens to host after a little while? They get yurks put in their heads. What will the yurks do? Open up their memories because something's just gone down in the earth pool. Did my host see anything? They would have seen this dweeby kid hiding behind this structure, holding water balloons and about to throw them. Every single one of those hosts has seen that now. And, you know, their sight's not been blocked by a laser grid because apparently that's not working today. He's been seen. They can probably recognize his clothing, his height. His skin colour, his hair colour, his hair style, you know, and not only that, but behind Rachel, in the very next shot, they're right next to her! <laughs> they're right there! They're like two metres away! <laughs> but we're not, we're not sure if these are hosts or controllers yet, but look, three, at least three people are standing right next to where Rachel is hunkered down for an ambush. Who shot the director? What's going on? It's not a very good ambush <laughs> when you're... Oh my God, I can't. This episode has taken a right downturn. You know, if, if these are hosts or even controllers, they're gonna say, oh, there was, a, there was a blonde girl with water balloons. She's wearing a striped shirt, you know, quite fashionable. And uh, she was about that height. She was that skin color. And the other lot would say, oh, and um, there was that guy with that height and that age, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and then uh, somebody could come up and say, oh, did you know that the Berenson cousins match those descriptions? Oh, let's nab them. Security lapse, guys. 
the Hawk Bajir that's been wandering around then flips the bird at the bird. And he, it's, he's get, he gets owned. He gets owned so hard that he just explodes. <laughs> And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the death of Tobias. <laughs> the Hawk Bidier just gives him, gives him that. I can't swear on YouTube, but I'm afraid. But just imagine what's behind this hand here. He goes, mm, sod you, you bugger. And Tobias just explodes with the sheer force of the offensive gesture. Now, there was a Dracon beam in there, but that's what, it, that's what I imagine happened. And why did this happen? Well, because Tobias was screeching his freaking head off. Tobias, if you don't want to die in the yurt pool, stop going rah, 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 in the middle of the freaking yurt pool. You dozy twonk. Are you trying to give the game away again? Are you sabotaging it again, mate? Right, you did something useful in this episode, but then you've brought it right back down, haven't you? You've gone right back to being Tobias the sod. <laughs> so yeah, Tobias is dead now. That's great, I suppose. Rachel then breaks cover, runs along, and she gets hit by a near miss, which sends her flying into the yerk pool. Oh no, Rachel falls into the yerk pool, look. She fell in. And um, just keep this in mind for when we eventually come to the face-off three-parter episode. Just keep, keep this in mind. And this is a reminder to myself as well. Rachel falls in. What happens next? Well, let's, let's look. Of course, Visa 3 arrives just in the nick of time. He's not in his Andalite body because of budget and crappy costumes, but he immediately senses an Andalite presence. He tells nobody to move, but let's be honest, there's nobody even there, Visa 3. We get a shot of these Yerks hurrying over to the side of the Yerk pool and staring in, but nothing seems to come of it. As, it's almost as if they've seen Rachel fall in and they're trying to see where she is. But just as Visa 3 is giving his evil moustache twirling monologue, Rachel assures Jake via thought speak that she made it out. You can't escape, you know that, don't you? It's okay, Jake. All your foolish plans for nothing. I made it out. When, why and how? The, nobody, uh, the place is apparently surrounded by yurks. They saw somebody fall into the yurt pool and not one of them is going to be spotting that, looking for somebody crawling out of the yurt pool. Unless she morphed something, but that would have been nice to know. I'm assuming that, but what would she morph to get out of the yurt pool? Would she climb out? I mean, we, we just never see. We just, we just don't know. Because the next time we see her, she's a lion. <laughs> but no, nobody saw her exit the yurt pool and Visa 3 thinks that she's still in there. I don't know. Whatever. Carry on. I will give the show some credit here, actually. Axe talks to Visa 3 in thought speak while he's in his human form. This is unusual because in the earliest books of the Animal series, Axe tried speaking in thought speak as a human, but because humans naturally speak, which is bollocks, he can't use his thought speak while in his human body. But the TV series rightly says, now that doesn't make sense. He's able to use thought speak now. So well done TV series for fixing that. And again, it's one of those things where this episode does something right. It does a lot of things right, this episode. But in amidst, it's all in amidst a sea of rubbish, which we'll see more of now. Visa 3 does a pretty good monologue where the gist of it is he would happily sacrifice a thousand yurks in order to get his way. So he's not too fussed about the whole oatmeal thing. It's at that point that Rachel suddenly appears every time he is near. That's a crap joke, by the way. She jumps up and knocks Visa 3 down into the yerk pool. He really must learn to look behind him, mustn't he? Remember, was it a couple episodes ago where the, <laughs> a dog comes up and knocks him from behind? Well, now a lion's come up and knocked him from behind. Maybe the solution to that, Visa 3, is to be in your own and light body where you've got 360 vision. Maybe this would stop happening. But no, budget and crappy costume and blah de blah de blah. Ugh. Once Visa 3 is knocked into the pool, the animals start launching their water balloons that proceed to not explode upon impact with the water, rendering the entire mission pointless. 
Visitor 3 then, with help from the other controllers, walks out of the Yerk pool and immediately gets splattered in the face with oatmeal. Ha <laughs> ha Very funny! Very funny! It's not sp They're in a Yerk pool, it's not supposed to be a funny place. And again, it's a book 17. <laughs> it's crap. I blame the source material. We then get some of the most hilarious stuff from the whole series. You, you see these fumbling, bumbling idiots <laughs> coming up. It's actually this frumpy guy here. Th these frumpy, bumpy <laughs> These fumbling, bumbling controllers just immediately emerge out of these walls with their Dracon beams. They just spawn in <laughs> and start launching themselves around in a manner that I can't even begin to describe. I'll just have to put them together in a little montage for your viewing pleasure. They start jumping around like... I, I don't even know what I, what I can reference here. It's just weird. Why are they jumping at... I, d I really don't understand what the director was trying to get at. Is it supposed to be funny? Is it supposed to be dramatic? Because it's not. It really isn't. It looks, frankly, ridiculous. Oh, and then you get these two, by the way. These two controllers armed with long-range weapons see a lion at long range standing perfectly still. Do they think to shoot with their weapons? No, of course not, because that would be logical. Jake, amidst all this humorous antiquary, finds the dead body of Tobias. <laughs> oh wait, we're not supposed to be laughing at that part. This monstrosity of an E.T. Gollum puppet thing then approaches Jake and has him bang to rights. Now, not only can it recognise him now, basically like everybody else in this yerk pool, but he basically just kill him right there and then. But unfortunately for the Hawk Bajir of the TV series, they're overpowered by tiny little water balloons. If these puppet monster things weren't intimidating enough already, then surely now they are like the subjects of your everlasting nightmares. I mean, water balloon weakness, it's, it's unbelievable. Marco is the one who has thrown this water balloon that's defeated the Hawk Bajir, and then the same controller that was able to catch Tobias pretty much spot on earlier and kill him, shoots like this. You know, that's about what? I mean, looking at perspective here as well, that's probably about eight to 10 meter miss. He's missed by about eight to 10 meters. He managed to get Tobias pretty spot on earlier, but because we can't kill Marco, he, yeah. My God. By the way, at this point, pretty much every single animal must have been recognized by face. I mean, surely that's an issue? Or are we just gonna brush over that? The animals make their getaway up the main staircase. Uh, Rachel as Lion, by the way. So they run up this staircase and not a single controller decides to follow them. And then much like earlier, there's a large portion missing. So they run up the stairs as humans slash lion. And Axe is a human morph, by the way, so he's got two steps to go through in terms of morphing. And then we immediately just cut back to, oh, they're crawling out of this hole as ferrets. There's a big chunk missing in there, isn't there? Why did no controllers follow them? How did they have time to morph ferret slash demorph and then morph ferret get back into this hole, which is probably on the ceiling, by the way, <laughs> and crawl up through there? How did they have time? Did not a single controller come across them doing that? Or did they, as soon as they reach the staircase, the controls are like, rats, we can't possibly ascend stairs. And then there's one more problem as well. Didn't, T T T Jake picked up Tobias's corpse, didn't he? And then he ran up the stairs, we assume still holding Tobias's corpse. And then they're all ferrets and they climb up back through the hole. How did they get Tobias out? <laughs> they just left his corpse in the earth pool then. Great. <laughs> Unless Jake just dragged this corpse through the hole. I, it's just, it, there's, 
it doesn't connect. It does not connect at all. They completely just brushed it over, like, just ignore that. Pay no heed to the ferret behind the curtain. We then fade into the inner monologue that will bring an end to the episode. It's the most pointless ending monologue, by the way. It can basically be summed up as, I don't like the yerk pool, and Visa 3's a big meanie head. It doesn't bring any sort of summary to the mission. It doesn't say anything about Tobias, although we do get this shot of Tobias flying there just before the end credits kick in. Does that mean Tobias is dead? Why else would they just overlay the shot of him flying down from the trees? He's dead. He's, bl he's blatantly dead at this point. But then again, so was Chapman in episode three. We did our best. You have failed once again. Ah! So yeah, Tobias is dead. The inner monologue is completely irrelevant. And will we see any consequences of this mission going forward? Absolutely not. Does the oatmeal ever come up again? Like sod, does it? And that's the episode. <laughs> this episode is a complete mixed bag. On the one hand, you've got actually very good stuff. On the other hand, it's entirely dreadful and there's nothing in between. It's either very good or very bad. And it's the two extremes. It bundles up into one episode. It follows the book pretty solidly up until the end. And sometimes it even does stuff better than the book did, which isn't hard because it is a pretty rubbish book. But then it throws in so much tripe. Like, is Tobias actually dead? Like, sit... I know I've joked about it enough, but he was very clearly dead. And they wouldn't have been able to drag him back up that ferret hole. I'm absolutely certain without, like, ripping his body in half because, you know, they're small creatures and a ferret dragging a bird through a, a ferret hole? is not going to go well for the bird. Not at all. Um, so yeah, just like Chapman in episode three, Tobias is now dead. And the Omo film thing will come to nothing. The whole stuff with controllers jumping about like some parody of The Matrix was bizarre. The water balloon plot was weird, especially how they got it in there. But I do largely blame the source material for that. But at the same time, we got some pretty good barn scenes. We got Chip, whose scene was excellent, quite frankly. Uh, the, the first part, the first half of the episode largely is actually very good for Animals TV series standard, and it interpreted the book quite well. So full credit for that. But that last part with the pool was just completely not a nonsense, honestly. This episode isn't as bad as the message. It's probably on par with On The Run, which, in hindsight, isn't too bad an episode. It just goes to show how bad the TV series is, doesn't it? Oh my god. But there you go, there's the TV series episode 7, The Escape. A very, very mixed bag. It's like the definition of mixed bag when it comes to the Animals TV series of really good moments, really, really bad moments, and not very much in between. So let me know your thoughts about this episode, and I shall see you for the next one. Thank you very, very much for watching, and I shall see you somewhere else in the Animals universe. Ta-ra!